when it's a test, not a test, right? We keep hearing conflicting stories from various different politicians. Some of them say testing, testing, testing is the way forward. Others say the problem with testing is it's not really a silver bullet. Others say, uh, well, of course, if we can test and trace more people, uh, then we'll know more about it. Others are now saying this morning on the front page of The Times, uh, the children's czar, Anne Longfield, not somebody I have a great deal of faith in, to be honest, uh, says make virus tests routine for teachers and pupils. Well, why? would be my question. Let's ask Peter Hitchens. Peter, very good morning to you. Morning. Now, uh, testing, it seems to me, uh, is something that nobody can agree upon because we keep hearing conflicting stories as to whether it's effective, whether it's worthwhile, uh, whether there's any point to it. You know, I'm, I'm very confused at this point. Well, so am I. From the beginning of this, I remember some people say, saying that uh, testing, testing, testing. Yeah. They sound a bit like, like um, uh, the old Blair going on about education, mm. education, education. Right. That's a, a, a slogan which he certainly didn't live up to. No. Uh, as if it was some kind of uh, magic incantation. Mm. As if the, the virus, when tested, would be frightened and run away. Yeah. Uh, I could never see what the connection was between testing and and, and trying to, to to deal with the virus. Uh, it seemed to me to be a, 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 so much of this has seemed to me to be a, a, a ignoring the great lesson of King Canute's uh, struggle against the tide, uh, which is I don't think any more even taught in schools. We don't understand what it was, no. and, and you can tell from from the way people behave what he was demonstrating. When he set his throne up on the seashore and ordered the tide to go back, he was demonstrating to his courtiers, there are some things governments just can't do, Mm. kings can't do. I can't command the tide. No more can governments command the spread of a virus, which by its nature is is going to get through almost all human defenses and and has done and does. what, What we now have with testing is a is a constant excuse uh, for the government to claim that things have not got any better mm. uh, and p- what ex- completely astonishes me about this is that people take it seriously yeah anybody looking at the figures you can go to to Statista, uh, one very important website which does the deaths per million mm. in, in every country or you can go to the coronavirus uh, worldometer and you can look at the state of play in every single country in the world and what you'll find is that in most countries the number of people dying from coronavirus has dropped enormously from where it was, particularly in the, the, the European countries, I should mm. say, enormously from where it was in April, and the deaths are very much lower. So what these tests are showing, uh, uh, what, things which are grandly called cases and infections, are positive tests. If you then look at the, the figures for hospitalizations and deaths, you'll find that the, there's almost no connection between the level no. of, of positive tests and hospitalizations, let alone deaths. Most of these people have either very mild symptoms or no symptoms at all. Right. So what does it mean? Why, what, what it's actually showing, if you look at it rationally and if you, if you stop and think for just a moment, is that actually the disease is not that serious. Well, that's the uh, thing. I, mean, I was just thing talking to... I was just talking to Carol Sakura, who said, I, he said, you know, the lockdown in Leicester is over. I said, were there any additional deaths or uh, increased hospital admissions? He said, no. Yeah. You know, it's well, crazy. I, what, what, we discussed this. I mean, the, 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 the figures about increased cases in Leicester followed an eightfold increase in the number of testing centres. Yeah. And this just happens over and over again. And you, you look at the number of tests conducted, for instance, in New South Wales or Victoria and Australia, and they've gone up enormously. And good heavens, they found an awful lot more so-called cases, mm. so-called infections. And th- this, in, uh, along with a very small number of deaths, most of them, uh, uh, regrettable as all deaths are, but nonetheless it's important to note this, most of them among very old people with, uh, who were already quite ill, uh, has been used as a pretext for shutting down the entire vast city of Melbourne. Yeah. Uh, in the most extraordinary uh, it, it's a state of state of emergency, such as one might normally see at a, at a time of invasion, mm. and it's completely ridiculous and disproportionate. But but what again? There is no the parliament doesn't exist, uh, and the, the media seems to have checked its brains in somewhere and and, and for, forgotten the ticket. Well, exactly right, and that's where we are now because every weekend before I speak to you on a Monday, I'm reading more and more pieces over the, over the course of various different media and watching stuff on the news. There's a kind of disconnect going on between people who I think have reached the point of no return where they don't care anymore and they're quite happy to go out. Um, I had a little birthday bash on Friday night in a pub not far from here. Uh, the people who came were all very happy to come. Um, there was a little bit of social distancing going on, but there was a bit of hugging going on from time to time. There was other people who were visiting the pub, going out for a meal. 
and and they're all quite happy to go about what you would regard as normal social uh, behaviour, and yet there's an entire other group of people who are telling me they're frightened to get on a train. I know, and they are frightened. And yeah. this, I, I, I used to think maybe they were making it up, and I'm, no doubt some of them are, but to stay away from work, but an awful lot of people are genuinely afraid. Yeah. But if I walk into Marks and Spencer's not wearing a muzzle, that I will kill them. Yeah. They really think that. They do. And they think that I am a, a horrible, brutal, selfish criminal for, for, for doing yeah. this thing. And th this, this is the case. I mean, I have, in, in my time, believed some stupid things. And no doubt... Oh, we all I have, believe, I suppose. No doubt I believe some now and will realize later that this isn't so. But generally, I believe them because I hadn't investigated what I was, uh, what I was thinking or yeah. saying. And uh, I was falling in with the crowd. It's quite rare for me to have taken a position... Uh, which wasn't a crowd position and found later on that that was wrong. Right. I mean, have you at any point in your discourse, and I know you've occasionally had doubts when you've said them to me, but have you ever thought from the beginning of this that you might be wrong? You have to think it. Uh, on every occasion, I, this, is, uh, this happened to me, I remember, on a completely different issue, I, I, try, I joined in a campaign to clear the name of, of, um, of, of a dead bishop of the Church of England who'd been accused of, of child molesting. Mm. And at the beginning of it, I said to the other people who joined me, this, that we, have to be, we, we have to be prepared, we, we must never be afraid of the truth, we might be wrong. Mm. Uh, we have to be completely rigorous about how we pursue this. And if in the course of pursuing it we find that, that in fact, this man did do the terrible thing which he's accused of, mm -hmm. then we have to be the first to admit it. Yeah. There is no other way to approach any battle about facts and logic. You have to be prepared to accept that you might be wrong. Yeah. Or you will close your mind at crucial moments to important things and you will make a mess of it. And you've said this about Boris Johnson and his government, haven't you? Because they will refuse forever, as far as you're concerned, to admit that they may have made uh, an error in uh, sort of diagnosing COVID. And I suppose their, their cloak of security um, is the rest of the world. Because aside from very, very few countries, almost everybody's acted as, as Boris Johnson has acted. Yes, and also there's a, a myth has been constructed, uh, which will be used when the inquiry eventually happens, that the reason why things went wrong was not that they did it at all, but that they did it too late. Mm. Uh, over and over again, the people who are prepared to, to criticize the, the, the event will criticize the conduct of it, but not the actual nature of it. No one will say, it was a mistake to do this. They will say, well, we did it wrong. Yeah. And that's been the attitude taken by, by Keir, Keir, Sir Keir Starmer, I want to say, the leader of the opposition, mm. uh, that he's never criticized the action itself, only the implementation of it. And, and it, minds are completely closed to the possibility mm. that this, this might have been a mistake. And, and until the government admits that it might have been a mistake, those people will still be frightened and will still think I'm a murderer when I go to Marxist. Yes, yeah. and I don't know whether you saw the piece at the weekend, I think it was in the Times initially, about the Swedish... Um, sort of situation which you have always mentioned in passing as, a, as an example of what could have been done and how it could have been done differently, where, where some of their scientists in Sweden were saying they couldn't understand the decision-making that was coming out of SAGE here and was coming out of this government. They thought it was bonkers. Well, of course they did, and because, because what they saw was a, was a panic. And Sweden is, and for, for all its many faults, and, and they, they do, it does have many faults, it, it's, it's a grown-up country in a way that we're not. And education levels are, I think, significantly higher. Uh, and there's a there's a there's an unwillingness to panic, mm. uh, which uh, and and what uh, and what also they, they they don't seem to have any equivalent of sage. And I'm still fascinated by some of the sage documents which have come out, where it's quite clear that there were people in the in within government who actually wanted to panic the population. Mm. And he, here is this thing from one of the sage documents: options for increasing adherence to social distancing measures from the 22nd of March. Uh, persuasion, paragraph two, the perceived level of personal threat needs to be increased among those who are complacent using hard-hitting emotional messaging. To be effective, this must also empower people by making clear the actions they can take to reduce the threat. Uh, it, it, and, and this this is, some thought went into this. Social psychologists have been active here. We have been, we've been worked on by hidden persuaders to try and make us afraid. Yes. But I think this is also a function of the way that our society has evolved, without wishing to get too philosophical and deep. I got an email at the weekend from a water company called Southeast Water, who basically said, uh, important message, only use water for essential purposes. Um, please uh, only use it for drinking, hygiene and cooking. And then it said, people in your community were without water yesterday as a result of very high demand. 
Now, I would suggest to you, Peter, that that's a complete barefaced lie. Why would people well, be without be water? Bit, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I, one water company I had experience of, I remember they, I, I reported to them a pretty considerable leak in the main, yeah. which, was, which was pouring down a small river down a, a road, a hillside road, not far mm. from where I live. And after I eventually got through to them after about five attempts, and they said, oh, well, that's not, it's, it, we'll fix that sometime in the next three weeks. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, that's not, it's, we don't regard that as being an important enough leak to do, to do any kind of emergency action. And I never took any notice of any of their pleas to save water after no. that, because they plainly didn't really mean them. In any case, the water companies, the history of the, the selling off of the water companies and the, their attitudes they take and their lack of investment in all kinds of things which would really uh, save water is so bad. But I, I'm reluctant to pay much attention to anything. Exactly. Like that. And, it, and I, and I, the use of this social pressure, which is increasing, you, know, you must, you, know, you must be a, a, a loyal public. Yeah. If you don't, if you, if, if you have, the, if you have that bath, if you water your garden, then you will be depriving others in your neighbourhood yeah. of water, and it will be your fault. Yes. And with the implied threat, we know who you are. Yeah. And it's absolute <laughs> nonsense. And meanwhile, well. they're leaking millions of gallons into the ground at any given minute of the yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. And equally, the people that I really find offensive are the people who are creaming off millions and millions of pounds, the directors of these privatised companies, who have been literally handed a licence to print money by previous governments. Yeah. And, that, and this is how Britain is now run. I mean, looking at yeah, Serco... After, after, after the railways, the water companies are the absolutely best argument against privatisation. Yeah. I, mean, I would, I would nationalise the whole thing again. I would. Like a shot. Yeah, which I never thought I would say. without compensation. I mean, they've made, they've made enough out of it not to require any compensation, in my view, but it, it, yeah. has, it has really, really not worked for the benefit. No. I mean, it of turns you into a sort of, you know, um, Chavez type, you know, Venezuelan president, where you just go, right, we're taking all that back because you've taken the mickey out of us for too well, long. Let's not go too far. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I took a trip to Venezuela a few years ago yeah. to see how, how Comrade Chavez was getting on. I do not recommend it. No, I'm sure you're right. But you know what I mean? A short, they managed to contrive a shortage of absolutely everything, including in, in a country which produces it, of oil. Yes. And this is, this is an amazing achievement. They did manage to lose money on oil, which is quite hard well, to they, do. They, they was, it, it, it was a catastrophic, and yeah. remains, I'm afraid, a catastrophic regime. People should be beware of getting, yes. of getting seduced by it. Uh, any, any direct experience of it. Was, but also, this is why I've it's also... A disastrous, it's a disastrous society. I remember going... Uh, it, 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 going back to my hotel room and finding that I'd left my laptop out, mm. and the, there was a huge notice from the hotel saying, "Don't be so stupid!" And the, the laptop <laughs> was chained down by about 19 bits of steel cable right. because this, you cannot leave anything anywhere in this country right. uh, without expecting it to be stolen. And wow. this, this was a major hotel in the centre of the capital. Incredible. But this yeah, is, but this that's is... what it was like. It's, well, it, and it, it, murder as well, too, I have to say. Not yes, I there. bet. But, but, I mean, you know, looking again at the... I mean, I've come to the conclusion that the, the, the migrant um, um, crisis that we're currently facing, which Priti Patel says that she's going to fix is entirely driven by not the people on the, on, the, on the French side who are making fortunes out of it, but by the people on this side who are making fortunes out of it quite legitimately, i.e. the people running the big companies who are apparently um, people like Serco, whose major shareholders are asset management companies, BlackRock, you know, one of the most capitalistic companies based, I think, on uh, East 53rd Street in Manhattan, you know, who have got their fingers into all sorts of pies. These are the kind of companies that go into Iraq and repair it after the damage has been done by the bombs. You know, there's something we've somehow lost control, in my view, of the running of our governments and the running of our countries. Well, maybe so. I know those are connections I, I, I haven't m myself made. And the people who are, who are largely responsible for this, and there are two sets of people responsible, politically responsible, those who blew up the world with the Iraq war and the Libya war and created, and indeed the, the intervention in Syria, which created these great waves of, of migration where people that had such miserable lives at home that it seemed worth their while to trudge across thousands of miles to find mm. somewhere else to live. Uh, and and they, they have a lot of responsibility to bear. And then, of course, the people smuggling gangs. Right. Uh, who are making millions. Uh, well, they are. And whose exploitation of these people is, is appalling. And nobody seems to be able to find any way of stopping. Hmm. It's very hard. I get the, 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 once the people have got used to the idea that the channel is actually quite easy to cross in the summer months, which I don't think have been commonly understood before. No. Uh, once that's happened, it's very, very difficult if there is a large number of people coming across Europe to do anything about it. I, the, we are, Australia has the, the, the advantage of very wide seas between mm. it and the, the, the main source of yeah. migration. So it can do these things like pushback, and it can indeed it can put 
uh, illegal immigrants into um, in, in, into camps on remote islands, yeah. uh, which we cannot we cannot do, whether you approve of these things or not. And there are arguments about them. But if you if, if, if anybody who who says, oh, I can fix this, let's send in the Marines. Mm. Uh, we can do this. You have to say, how exactly are you going to do it? How are yes. you going to do push back in the channel where there are no international waters? Uh, where are you going to put people if, if once you've taken them off their flimsy little kayaks and rafts? What are you going to do with them? Yes. Legally, what can you do? I, I'm very mistrustful of the boasts of politicians about their ability to sort this out, I'm afraid. It, it has a much deeper reasoning behind it, and uh, I'm not sure that it is, in fact, soluble. No, well, that's the problem. And I, I'm less convinced than, than, than I was, particularly now that I know that there is private um, capital being made in this country by people who are just involved in, in commerce, as, effectively. You know, as long as they get a number of people coming, they will make money per head, and I'm sure that's how they how they add it up. But let's move on to the House of Lords, because you wrote an interesting piece about Claire Fox at the weekend, I thought. Um, and and, and your, what, what I liked about the piece was that you said you actually had quite a bit of time for Claire Fox, but you were just oh, I rather, do. I think she's, rather she's, surprised she's, she's, that she's she was elevated person. in such a way. She's an interesting person. She, she, she's prepared to, to stand up for herself and say things that other people um, don't, don't like her saying mm. and has been right on some things and is an interesting voice and has made a, a very successful career. I, this has nothing to do with personal animosity. Mm. Uh, but it, what, the point I was trying to make was this. Here, here was the, the, this person who belonged to the Revolutionary Communist Party, which in 1993, when the horrible Warrington bomb went off and, and killed those two children, yeah. Uh, was prepared to defend the uh, the action as legitimate. Yeah. And uh, what's more, when challenged about this, and there's a very interesting article about this in in, um, in in a magazine called The Critic, when challenged about this, she 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 stuck to her guns, as it were, and said, mm. no, no, I'm not. This, 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 my opinions uh, haven't changed. And although she was she made the necessary noises of personal sympathy, she did not denounce her previous position. And, uh, and, and, and as, a, as a result, of course, the, um, the, the, she, she, it, it raises the point, what is a conservative prime minister, I, I use the word with a capital C, uh, whose party uses the Union Jack as its emblem, which is given to singing Land of Hope and Glory, putting someone like Claire into doing, putting someone like Claire into the House of Lords. I mean, it may well be that there is a place for someone like Claire in Parliament, and, and that's, that's an argument for another time. Mm. But if the Conservative Party is what it says it is, then this is a bizarre thing for it to do. What I'm trying to get people to do is to think about what the Conservative Party is. I'm yes. not actually really having a particular go. I mean, completely disagree with her about the IRA. I've always yeah. hated the IRA. Me too, yeah. I hated, when I was a trot, I hated the IRA. I had mm -hmm. people expelled from my, from my sect in the 1970s for, sh for shouting victory to the IRA on yeah. demonstrations. I hated them so much. Yeah. Uh, th that's, that remains my position. But what is the Conservative Party, which, which got an awful lot of its support from attacking Jeremy Corbyn for his sympathy uh, with Irish republicanism, what are they doing putting Clare uh, into the House of Lords? It, it does, doesn't fit if the Tory party is what it claims to be uh, on its tin. Well, if you could claim uh, whatever the Tory party is currently supposed to be, uh, I would probably buy you a very large lunch because I don't know what it stands for anymore. I can tell Honestly. you what it is. Go on. It's a, it's a, it's a Blairite formation. It, it was clubbed into, into Blairism by, by David Cameron. Yeah. And this was, uh, I, I wrote a book about this called, called The Cameron Delusion in which I explain exactly how the Conservative Party was overwhelmed by the Blairites and turned into, into a branch of, of, of New Labour, which it has been ever since. Yeah. And, and Mr Johnson, remember, when he was mayor of London, he effectively became Ken Livingstone. Mm. To become mayor, he took he, he took and one of the people he took on was a was a was a lady called Manira Mirza, yeah. uh, who is now his, the head of his policy unit, who, who is also associated with the Revolutionary Communist Party, uh, and it's it's outgrowth. I, 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 there's some dispute about whether she actually belonged to it, yeah. uh, but she's there as the head of his policy mm. unit. And I presume uh, also this, this, by people think people think the Conservative Party is conservative really do need to do a bit of reading. But by making the Conservative Party Blairite, and I totally agree with what you said that David Cameron had done, they also then left the husk of the Labour Party behind, which is still struggling with that. I saw that over the weekend, I think it was Robert Colville wrote an interesting piece about how Sir Keir Starmer has now become sort of beige. Um, so I've gone, he's gone from forensic to beige in the space of about three months. It is a difficulty. I mean, the, the, the big problem for the, for the Labour Party is their, their complete loss of Scotland. 
Yes, uh, which, which is, they're never uh, getting back. Left them very difficult. I don't think they are getting it back. No, it's left them in a very difficult, ele- difficult electoral position. And, of course, the utter collapse also of the, of the Liberal Democrats, who might at one point have formed a coalition with them. Yeah. But who knows what the future will bring? I, in, in all our politics lies on one side of a deep and dangerous river at the moment, mm. which we are about to cross, which is the deep and dangerous river of economic c- collapse. Right. Have you got and a coracle? Everybody handy? struggles out of the other side of that, or when actually everybody doesn't. <laughs> uh, I'm not the, sure what we're crossing it in. Differently about politics, I think. What are we crossing it in? It feels like it's a coracle that's going to just go round and round and round and probably get swept uh, in down. In many cases, stark naked. <laughs> um, I'm trying to, 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 to see if I can get a millionaire to ferry me across well, the listen, yacht. But listen. You know, I, I, I don't know any. So, I, But it, it's billionaire, I should say. Millionaires are nothing these days. Well, if you go and hang um, around in one of those uh, expensive hotels in the West End, you'll probably find a couple of Russians might be able to help you out. <laughs> I know. We I have see. other problems with Russians already. Thank <laughs> you very much. Quite. Peter, this is great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Peter Hitchens uh, with the latest update on the way things are uh, and the way they should be and uh, perhaps the way they will be. Who can say? Uh, we are in very dangerous, choppy waters. There's no question about that. Uh, Peter, always uh, entertaining and, and fascinating to talk to. Uh, we do it every Monday. He'll be back next Monday too. Uh, 